Okay, good morning uh, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the class today, BC212 on Christian apologetics. I've just uh, started the recording, so this lecture will be recorded and uh, will be made available uh, after the class. Okay, why don't we just pray together and um, get started with, with a word of prayer. Just want to invite somebody um, to lead us in prayer. How about um, uh, Mrs. Nalni Oliver? Would you please like to pray for us as a class and we can get started? Okay, um, not sure. All right, uh, Tarun, would you like sure, to pray? Master, we'll pray. Yeah. Father, thank you. Thank you for um, this class uh, that we are about to attend. We pray uh, and invite your spirit to lead us in every part of the discussion. And as we learn through, Father, we pray that we are filled uh, with uh, your wisdom, Father. We are standing as channels as we interact with people, um, uh, to uh, uh, give a reason to our faith uh, as we do so and as we learn, Father, we pray that uh, you humble ourselves and lead us into the right places where we could learn rightly and uh, 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 be a channel of your blessing as we interact with people, Father. We thank you for what we are learning today. We thank you. Uh, for all the uh, content that you have blessed us with. Uh, we pray that uh, we continue to be a uh, blessing to many, Father. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, our plan today is to just wrap up the introduction part, which we started uh, last week. Uh, and uh, uh, the introduction where we want to just uh, emphasize that as far as uh, our approach to uh, Christian apologetics or what we refer more correctly as biblical apologetics is that uh, it, it involves both reason and demonstration. And uh, so I just want to bring that, uh, wrap that up uh, to a close. And then we get into our first chapter, which is on um, uh, the existence of God. So I just put those notes out maybe half an hour back during the mentoring session. Um, so um, you can download that PDF uh, and we'll get started with our discussion on uh, um, the existence of God. And, uh, you know, uh, we will cover the outline, uh, the, the content, but then there are a lot of questions that emerge out of that and happens every year uh, when students ask a lot of questions about you know, various other things related to the existence of God and which we will um, either take up uh, if we have time today or we will uh, bring those questions in uh, next week. All right. So that's kind of the plan for the two lectures we have uh, today. I'll uh, uh, share the PDF, uh, which um, uh, which is available in the um, get rid of that one, Matt, in the uh, coursework section. So just to quickly review of how we got started last week, uh, we talked about you know we went through the word apology itself, saw that it's been used in many different contexts in in, in a way of giving defense. Very often in a hostile environment, people had to explain what we believe responding to ideas, pointing to evidence, and so on. We we'll talked about Peter's apologia, what it really meant that the emphasis really is on uh, the demonstration. Uh, we looked at Paul, how he uh, br brought his defense in various situations. And for him as well in his ministry, we saw that it was both reason and demonstration of the power of God. Uh, then we transitioned into talking about uh, uh, understanding the spiritual dynamics that is involved. Um, and just to quickly summarize, uh, we, we understand that uh, Satan and his demons are at work in this present, I mean, throughout, throughout time and 
especially in these days. Uh, in First uh, Timothy four one to four, uh, you know, the, Paul writes. He says, uh, "The Spirit speaks explicitly that in the latter days uh, there will be seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, and some will depart from the faith." You know, that's that's pretty strong. That means demonic interference uh, is going to be so strong. Uh, the work of seducing spirits and doctrines, that is, teaching of demons, is going to be so strong. It may it, it will even pull people away from the faith you know so there is this uh, significant interfere demonic interference in deceiving people keeping people away from the truth in getting people to think you know uh, in, in a direction that is opposed to the truth of God um, so that is one thing we must understand and uh, uh, and that's why we we you know uh, that you may have heard the phrase you know the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle so while we are providing a reason or we are explaining, we are providing reasons and uh, uh, so on, uh, remember the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. That means we must engage in the spirit to see people brought to faith in Christ. While we do this part as well, you know, we do have to give an explanation, a reason. The Bible teaches us to do that. Right? And uh, so we went through that and we were... We closed looking at this passage in Second Timothy chapter two. Maybe we'll uh, we'll pick up from there, Second Timothy uh, chapter two, uh, and we'll just once again read these verses, verses twenty three to twenty six. Second Timothy chapter two, uh, verses twenty three to twenty six. Somebody could read that for us, so we'll just uh, refresh our minds on it and move forward from there, please. Anyone could read that for us. Second Timothy chapter two, verses 23 to 26, please. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the de devil after being captured by him to do his will. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samuel. So, you know, Paul is teaching us, you know, don't get into arguments, quarrels, uh, don't get into those kinds of things, right? So while, so this is a, a very important uh, instruction for us. While we are going to engage meaningfully and intelligently with people, and uh, you know, uh, do our best to respond to questions and you know, so on and so forth, uh, what we do avoid is getting into quarrels and getting into arguments. You know, he says, why? It, it only leads to strife. It's, it leads to a breakdown in relationships. But instead, our approach is in humility. That's verse twenty-five. In humility. We present the truth uh, to those who are in opposition. They may be, you know, uh, asking us questions, challenging our beliefs. But in humility, we present the truth to them, and trust that God will work in their hearts. God will open their eyes, and that they will, you know, uh, repent. They will turn to the truth and receive the truth. And he says, verse twenty-six. You know, this is something we need to understand that. There's a snare of the devil. I mean, it, it, Satan has is is holding them spiritually, of course. He's holding them. He's ensnared them with various things, various deceptions and lies and untruths and so on. So, you know, Satan has taken them captive. We are presenting the truth, and God is going to work in their hearts to give them repentance, to help them come to know the truth and come out of the snare of the devil. So, on a human level. We don't want to get into quarrels, strife with people. On a human level, we, in humility, present the truth. But spiritually, we are looking for God to work in their hearts and release them from the snare of the devil. Right. So that is where our 
dependence must be on the Holy Spirit. You know, we are going to learn a lot of things in this course. How do you respond? How do you, how do you present your case for the existence of God? How do you present your case for a creator and the creation? And how do you present, you know, various things? Okay, all of it is good. Uh, we must be equipped and we must do that well. But our dependence is on the Holy Spirit. That is something, uh, you know, uh, no argument can replace. Right. So let's just look at some scriptures on that. Uh, John 16, uh, 7 to 11. Somebody could read that for us, please. John 16, uh, 7 to 11. I'm going to slowly pick up speed like a train, you know, starts going faster and faster. So I uh, hope you'll stay with me. Uh, John 16, 7 to 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Mm, thank you. So Jesus is telling us about the work of the Holy Spirit. And he's telling us specifically what the Holy Spirit will do for the world or to the world, meaning those who are not saved. What's he going to do? He, verse 8, sorry, when he's come, he will convict the world. So the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to convict, meaning give evidence, you know, uh, give proof. He's going to convict the world. He's going to do this to people. And he's going to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right? Of sin. What is the sin he's going to convict them of? They do not believe in me. So that's the main sin. Right? And that's the sin that sends a person to an eternal hell. They do not believe in me. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict them of that sin. So, you know, we don't have to go and beat people on the head and say, why you don't believe in Jesus? Or, you know, why are you staying away from Jesus? No. The Holy Spirit will bring about that conviction in their hearts. The Holy Spirit will convict them of sin, of righteousness. Christ has been glorified. We have fallen short, but righteousness is possible through Jesus. He will convict the world of righteousness, of judgment. The ruler of this world is judged. It's pointless believing in Satan. Satan is defeated. Satan has been condemned. Right? The Holy Spirit is going to do that for, uh, he's going to convict the world. So our dependence, so while we present our, you know, our defense, our arguments or our, our reasoning and we present facts as simple and as clearly as we can, first of all, our dependence is on the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we must never underestimate the power of a life that is lived well. That means, you know, something really touches the hearts of people better than our best arguments. It is our life testimony. And we must never forget that. Because we can present arguments. Anybody can argue. You know, anybody can be trained to, you know, reason and debate and, uh, you know, anybody can do that. But nobody can question a life that is lived well. You know, a man with an experience doesn't have to answer to a man with an argument. You know, somebody has an argument. Hey, but I have an experience. I've gone through it. I know it. So a man with an experience doesn't have to answer to a man with an argument. That We can never underestimate the power of our testimony. So that's another second thing. You know, sometimes uh, we just have to keep our mouths closed and live our lives. Because that is going to impact those who see. And so I'm talking especially about those who, you know, who are in our immediate circle uh, of friends who are seeing our life over a period of time. There will be, of course, those who, you know, we just meet as acquaintances and we meet them for brief periods and they go away. And of course, we will have conversations with them. But there will also be those who are, you know, living life around us over time, for over years, they know us. 
Uh, and uh, yes, we will have conversations with them. We will present Christ to them, uh, explain, uh, give answers to their questions. And they may not seem convinced right away, but just remember the very fact that you live your life before their eyes is going to impact them. So look at First Peter chapter 2. And this is back into that same episode where uh, Peter is telling us to, you know, uh, be ready to give a, an answer uh, to everyone who asks us of that question. In that same episode, he has preceded that instruction with an earlier instruction for Peter 2. Somebody could read verses 11 and 12 for us, please. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Amen. Mm, thank you. So, yeah, this is the same episode where Peter later on in chapter 3 is telling people, you know, telling the believers, you know, be ready to give an answer. But before that, he said, look, you live your life free from all the fleshly lusts and things of this world. And you have an honorable conduct, your life, an honorable way of life before the Gentiles. Today they may speak evil about you, this verse 12, right? They they may laugh at you, they may you know laugh at your faith and then may speak all those things against your faith. But he says, in the day of visitation, that's a very interesting phrase, the day of visitation. This was a phrase even the Lord Jesus used when he uh, wept over Jerusalem. You know, um, he. Okay, somebody has to unmute their mute their mics. Uh, let me just. A lot of people waiting. All right. Um, all right. Can you all? Is everyone can hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just want to r r remind everybody, um, please try to connect to the class a minute or two before we start. Uh, because once we start, you know, I would be busy talking and I would change my screen to the PDF and I'd be looking at the notes. And that time what happens is this auto admit feature doesn't work very well in Google Classroom. So, if you connect to the class after we start, you're very likely to be waiting outside uh, until I kind of happen to change my screen back. So just try to connect to the class two minutes or a minute or two before we start. It will make sure you don't get locked out, uh, held up outside, okay? All right, so uh, yes, we were talking about this in uh, in First Peter 2.12 where Peter is using the phrase, the day of visitation, right? Uh, and that's a very interesting phrase because Jesus used that. And when he, Jesus used it, the context is God has come. God is here. Now he's referring to himself and he says, you know, he, God is visiting people here in the city of Jerusalem, but they were not unable to recognize God's visit. Right? So visitation really is God encountering that individual, the day of visitation. So what Peter, uh, so First Peter 2, right, uh, uh, 12. So he says, you know, they are going to have their day of visitation. That means they're going to have an encounter with God. And on the day of visitation, what's going to impact them? The good works which they have seen in you. The life that you have lived. Uh, you know, the, the honorable conduct that you have maintained before them, that's what's going to impact them on their day of visitation, when God encounters them. 
right? So that's the second uh, guidance for us. While we are presenting answers to people and you know all of that, they may accept, they may not accept, uh, they may still have more questions, they may argue with us, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but you're praying for them. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is going to convict them. And when God visits them, you know that your honorable conduct, the life you have lived, is going to impact them. And God will use your testimony, your life testimony, uh, in, in, in that day when he visits them. Okay? Second thing to keep in mind. And the third thing to keep in mind, which I just want to bring our attention to in this whole process of, uh, you know, us sharing our faith and uh, helping people understand, uh, you know, our faith is that uh, um, we see in Scripture, and maybe I'll just look. We'll just look at Second Corinthians three, um, uh, that many times, even though, um, uh, well, how I'm trying to see how to put it, um, you know, even though in our explanations, in our presentations of uh, our reasoning, we, we, we are appealing to the head. Salvation happens head to heart. So don't think salvation happens head to heart. Salvation happens heart to head. Right? The heart turns to the Lord and then the mind follows. How do we how can we say that? And if you look at Second Corinthians chapter three, uh, verse sixteen. We just look at verse sixteen, okay? Second Corinthians three and verse sixteen. Can somebody read that verse sixteen for us, please? Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay. Uh, it's interesting here. I mean, I, I know we picked out only one verse, but what Paul is saying is, look, there's a veil that's covering their eyes. Okay. And when the heart, previous verse 15, talk about the heart, a veil, there's a veil on the heart. But when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The eyes are opened. So the veil is on their mind. But when the heart turns to the Lord, the mind follows, the veil is taken away, right? So that's an important truth to keep in, in our minds as we speak to people. We are giving answers to deal with the questions that are in their minds. But sometimes, but very often what happens is this, that when God convicts them and their heart turns to the Lord, the seemingly impossible questions that were in their minds suddenly disappear. The veil is taken off. And sometimes we can't even explain, hey, this was the same guy two days ago was arguing with me about these questions and I know I didn't answer his questions, but now he's following Jesus. What happened? Well, when the heart turned to the Lord, the veil was taken away. God took care of it. You know, and uh, we've seen it happen in so many lives. You know, I've seen people come to church and uh, young people and they keep asking, you know, uh, very, all these questions on the Big Bang and all, all these scientific things. And okay, you try your best to answer and you're like, hmm, I don't think I did a good job here. Yeah. <laughs> And the next thing is they're like really in church and they're serving in church and they're wondering like, mm -hmm. I know I, there was, I didn't say anything great uh, to answer his questions, intellectual questions, but somehow in his heart, he got convinced about the reality of God. The heart has turned to the Lord and now those questions, they are gone, right? So keep that, uh, uh, and that, is, uh, that is a supernatural work, right? We, we can't explain it. Oh, so the point I'm making is this. Don't think that you have to always answer every question in order to get a person saved. We do our best. 
But when their heart turns to the Lord, the veil will be taken off. The, the, those, those, those things that are on their minds, which are preventing them from coming to the Lord, will be removed. And you know, they'll become followers of Christ. Keep that in mind, okay? And uh, some other thing that we, we must also depend on is the power of the gospel. And we are familiar with this. Um, uh, let me just bring our attention to First Corinthians 18. Um, sorry, First Corinthians chapter one. Um, I want to just summarize that very quickly for us, so that we could get into our main con content. First Corinthians one, and um, when you look at the uh, you know the passage there, verses eighteen to twenty-five. Okay, let's read it as we can get the full impact of it. First Corinthians chapter one, maybe we'll uh, read verse 17 to 25 and then I'll summarize that. First Corinthians 1, 17 to 25, somebody could please uh, read that for us. I think it's uh, good to read that whole passage there. Can I read it, sir? Please go ahead. But Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will trot. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, and the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a very powerful passage, right? Where Paul is uh, sharing with us the power of the message of the cross, the power of the gospel, right? So he's telling us here that in verse 17, the gospel, which is the message of the cross of Christ, uh, it is the power of God, verse 18. The message of the cross is the power of God. Right? And then he tells us about the world, verse 21. There's the wisdom of this world. There are the philosophies and there is science and there is uh, everything, you know, all kinds of things in the world. There's a wisdom of the world. But through that, the world is not getting to know God. What is God's response to that? He uses the simple message of the gospel to save people. So the world has its wisdom. Seems very complicated. But God's response is, hey, I have a simple message. It's the message of the cross of Christ. And through that message, I can save you. And so Paul says, we just preach that message. We preach Christ crucified. We present that message. And this message is both the wisdom of God and the power of God. Right? That's verse 24. It's the wisdom of God and the power of God. And we have different people. There are Jews who look for science. There are Greeks who want intellectual things. But our message is very simple. The message of the cross is the wisdom of God and the power of God. So as we talk about the course here on apologetics and we get into the various things we're going to learn in order to respond to people in the world, remember that ultimately we our confidence is in the power of the gospel. We depend on the Holy Spirit. We know that a life that's lived well will impact them. Uh, we know that uh, you know, the, uh, the Spirit of God will convict their hearts. And when the heart turns to the Lord, 
all these questions will disappear. And uh, we are depending on the power of the gospel. It is the wisdom of God, it's the power of God. So we just release that, release the simple message of the gospel, knowing that it will impact their lives, okay? Uh, before we get into this, uh, our first chapter on the existence of God, I just want to remind us, and this is something you will study in, um, in the other course that we have on um, uh, Christian history and missions. Um, and uh, in a, this is in chapter three on the book, uh, uh, Revival's Visitation Moves of God. Uh, those of you interested, you could get it just downloaded from our church website, that's the URL. And let me just quickly summarize uh, some of those things. What we see in the first 300 years of the church is that there were, you know, uh, um, I'd use the word apologists, people who rose up in the early church to defend important truths and doctrines of the church and to protect the church from the infiltration of heresies and other things. And you will read about them and you can read about them in, in chapter three of this book. Uh, so what I want to say is that apologetics is not uh, a new ministry in the body of Christ, right? It has gained prominence or significance maybe in the last 20, 30 years, the recent 20, 30 years. But it was there, not only from the time of, you know, uh, uh, from the Apostle Paul, but even in the early church. So you will find that in the early church, they faced a lot of uh, potential threats from heresies. For instance, there was the heresy that questioned the deity of Christ. Yeah. Uh, that were questioning uh, uh, what the church was preaching. And so, you know, people had to defend, uh, give an answer. There was things about the triune God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So is, uh, is the God of the Bible a triune God? Questions on that, challenging what the early church was preaching. And so the church had to defend that. And I think, and, and the high point of all of that was the, what happened uh, in around 8300 in the writing of the Nicene Creed. So this was uh, during the time of Emperor Constantinople when he called some of the church leaders together to Nikea and he said, you know, we will sit down and we will draft out, we will write down in a, in a very concise way what the church believes so that everybody espouses this are able to say it in a way, and, and that will help defend the church against, you know, the, the, the coming in of all these heresies and so on. And so the Nicene Creed was written, you know, we believe in one God, the Father, you know, the maker of heaven and earth. And you know, they, they emphasize key elements of the Christian faith, you know, the, the triune God and um, the, the work of Christ on the cross and his church and his coming again. So they emphasize the key uh, tenets of the Christian faith as a way to respond to or protect the church from, you know, all the, the wrong ideas and things that were coming in, the threats to the church, right? So those were kinds of uh, things that the early church had to defend. They had to defend the very doctrines, the very tenets of the Christian faith. Today, uh, questions are maybe more in the nature of, uh, you know, the existence of God and maybe a little bit more scientific and so on and so forth. The challenges are slightly different, but uh, we, it is, you know, it is our responsibility to be able to give a well thought out answer to people who bring up these questions. Okay, so one last comment here in uh, in this introduction is our approach is going to be philosophical, scientific, theological, and supernatural. So we're going to try and blend this uh, as we, uh, you know, formulate responses to various things. Okay. So now we're going to get into our very first uh, chapter, which is on the existence of God. Uh, and uh, I just want to ask, is there any questions on the introduction on chapter one before we jump into 
you know, uh, talking about the existence of God. Uh, uh, any questions so far? Uh, any thoughts, any comments? Okay, everyone is very quiet. Uh, yes, Pastor. Go ahead. And the question is, uh, when we uh, look at uh, this um, passage which we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, mm -hmm. where we read about the veil on the eyes. So, uh, should we look at it as individuals or are there people groups? Like we can say that there are certain people groups who have, uh, you know, it is difficult to approach them. It is difficult to convince them. Or is it a matter of individuals? Like uh, if, if you are um, talking to uh, an unbelieving friend, but pro probably they are particularly from a Hindu background or a Muslim background. So, you know, sometimes uh, ob if we observe, it's easy to talk to Hindu people rather than a Muslim person. So um, is this veil, uh, you know, we can... Uh, Identify it is uh, as an individual or as a people group. It is more difficult to approach and uh, convince. Okay, um, so this can be understood in both contexts, right? Now it is in in, in Paul's writing in Second Corinthians three. The context is a people group. He's talking about the Jewish people. Uh, he's talking about them that you know uh, they couldn't see. But then when they turn, then the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. A veil that covers all their minds uh, is then taken away when the heart turns to the Lord. So the context of Second Corinthians 3 is people group, but it definitely applies to individuals as well. Right? So um, uh, this uh, veil, this blindness, uh, as you pointed as you out, pointed out uh, uh, Okay, so uh, this veil, as you pointed out, does affect communities. You know, and if you uh, look at Revelation two, um, when uh, Jesus is speaking to the church in uh, certain cities, uh, he tells them that in your city, Satan has his throne. You know, if you um, if you look at uh, or, or he even talks twice, he talks about an assembly of Satan in that city, in the church in to Smyrna. Uh, and uh, he also writes to the church in uh, Pergamos. And he says, you know, in Pergamos, Satan's throne is. So can you imagine, uh, you know, Pergamos is a city. And Jesus is telling, hey, in that city, Satan has a throne, meaning, He's got a lot of influence in that city. That means people in that city are under that heavy demonic influence. Satan has his throne. Or in two other places, he talks about uh, there's a synagogue of Satan. There's an assembly of people, a community of people who are under the influence of Satan. And this, is, this all has to do with cities. So to answer your question, yes, uh, communities of people, cities can be brought under can be under a certain kind of a veil, a certain kind of uh, blindness. Um, but we can see at an individual level, we can also see at a community level, people turning to the Lord. You know, and there are various, various factors that can affect that. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Right. Any other question before we go forward? Um, Yes, so I see Rose's question. Uh, the whale, could it be a mental stronghold, like a religious mental stronghold? And the answer is yes, right? So anything that is keeping people from coming to the Lord, we refer to it as the whale, right? Paul looks at it, explains, he says, um, uh, Second Corinthians 4, for the God of this world has blinded the minds of people, right? So that's the whale. And, uh, but when the heart turns to the Lord, that just pff, goes off, you know, uh, it just dissipates. Yeah. All right. So we're going to, if there are no more questions, we're going to get into our first 
topic in our discussion uh, in apologetics, which is on the existence of God. Right? And uh, this notes, uh, this this no, uh, the note for this lecture is also um, uh, there. And we're going to break it down into parts. And as we'll talk about the existence of God, and this leads us into creator and creation, which we'll pick up uh, hopefully next week, right? Yeah. So uh, the existence of God. So as believers, you know, from what is our position? We know, right, that there's the eternal God uh, who's self-existent. And this God is also creator, right? Isaiah 40, verse 28, there is the eternal God. He's always been there and he is the creator. So that's what we believe. And uh, he is infinite, right? He never faints. He doesn't go weary. Uh, his understanding is infinite. So we believe that, right? God is infinite. We believe he's infinite in time, uh, he's infinite in his power, he's infinite in his understanding, right? So now that's something we know in our hearts. Uh, we may not fully comprehend it in our minds, right? We know what in our heart, we know it's true. And, uh, and, and of course we can, to some extent, articulate it with words, but really it's, uh, the finite that is trying to understand the infinite. So there obviously will be limitations, okay? And um, uh, so there will be limitations when we are trying to explain to other people, you know, we are trying as finite beings trying to exchange information about the infinite, about God who is way bigger than under our understanding, right? So there's limitations on both sides us who believe in God and those who are asking questions. But, you know, we must do our best to present uh, intelligently, uh, uh, you know, what uh, we believe, okay? So there are different kinds of people we are going to encounter who challenge the existence of God. Broadly, there are the atheists. The atheists say there is no God, right? There are the agnostics. The agnostic doesn't go to the extent of saying there is no God. The agnostic just says, well, if there is a God, I don't know, because it's impossible to know, right? So they are non-committal, right? They're, they're not saying there is no God. They're saying, well, I don't know if there's a God. If you can prove to me there is a God, I'll believe, <laughs> you know? So they are in that position. Right? It's impossible to know anything about God. So they live as though there is no God and, and so on. They don't make any, Thing. I just I just don't know. So why should I bother with it? So these are broadly speaking two kinds of people. And uh, here's a, in, uh, just some interesting statements, which I think which are pretty quite obvious. And Alex McFarland he says, you know, God is big enough to handle our questions, and He's not intimidated by the depth of our scrutiny. So we, even as as, as people, um, we are not afraid to handle questions and we are not afraid if people want to, you know, scrutinize or take a deep dive to explore it, all of these things. It's okay, it's good, you know, go ahead. Now, when an atheist says there is no God, that quest or that statement itself, actually, if you think about it, is a, is a statement that is erroneous. Why is it erroneous? Because when, a, when an atheist says there is no God, if you look at it, you know, uh, in, a, in a logical way of thinking, we are saying here is somebody or here's somebody who has thoroughly examined everything and has then come to the conclusion there is no God. But that is not the case because it's impossible for a human person to thoroughly examine everything. You know, we don't know the far expanse of this universe. Of course, we get estimates of the, uh, you know, okay, the, the size of the universe and the expanding universe and so on, we get saying, okay, this is so many billions of light, you know, billions of years old or light years or 
far away, all of those things. But still, that doesn't mean we have explored everything. And if there really is a spiritual realm, how you know how can you explore that spiritual realm? Right? What we are exploring is the natural realm. Uh, when we do all our scientific work. So for someone to make that statement, God does not exist. They are inherently claiming omniscience. That means I have thoroughly explored and examined everything and I've determined there is no God and therefore I'm concluding God does not exist. Now, an atheist may not you know, accept or let's say, uh, be willing to accept that, but that is what they are saying. Okay. Now, similarly, when you look at what an agnostic says, uh, the agnostic is saying, well, if there is truth, you cannot know it. Or, you know, he's, he's being non-committal, but then what he's saying is, uh, you can't know the truth. But the fact is, there are, you know, verifiable things in our known world, which we claim as truth. You know, we don't say, well, I don't know if gravity exists. No, we state with absolute confidence, gravity is there, and this is how much it is, and, and this is what you can exp uh, expect to experience because it is there, right? So to the agnostic, we can say, look, just as we in our everyday life and in our scientific realm, establish facts, we establish truth, or we call it laws, we establish laws. So that means truth is noble, a fact is establishable, a law is proven. Therefore, similarly, we can come to know the truth and we don't have to stay in a state of, I don't know, or not being sure. We can come to this place of knowing the truth. So that's, just in, in a broad sense, a response to the atheist and the agnostic, right? But let's quickly go through, you know, what the Bible says about God, and then how do we respond to the atheist, to the agnostic? How, you know, what can we put forward to them? So we'll go through some of that. And the next week, we get into the whole issue of creator and creation. How do we present evidence for that, okay? So, we will pause here uh, for this lecture. We will take a quick break and uh, we will come back. Uh, uh, everyone so with me so far, any quick question before we go for the break? Everyone's with me so far? Okay, just think through with me logically as we go through this step by step. Any questions, anything you want me to repeat, we'll be happy to do that, okay? So we're getting into the main content and uh, we will uh, start thinking. So you need to be awake. Make sure you get your tea or coffee and uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Be back. Uh, okay. We'll, become, we'll look at Charles' question right after we come from the break. Okay, Charles. Okay. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes.